I'm Denver criminal defense attorney Michael Becker. The general rule in Colorado is that adults may not have sex with minors under 17, which is the age of consent. But Colorado has a Romeo and Juliet law under CRS 18.3.402 that decriminalizes consensual sex between close in age partners. Here are five things to know. One. It is legal in Colorado for minors under 15 to have consensual sex with partners less than four years older. Two, it is also legal in Colorado for minors age 15 or 16 to have consensual sex with partners less than 10 years older. Three, the Romeo and Juliet law applies only when the sex is consensual. Otherwise, the aggressor faces sexual assault charges even if the victim is close in age to him or her. Four, adults who have sex with minors who are too young to qualify for the Romeo and Juliet exception always face sexual assault charges. It does not matter if the minor consented to or initiated the sex. And five, it is not a defense to sexual assault charges that the defendant genuinely believed the victim was old enough to consent. But again, Right away, I'm 13. Right away, I'm 14. Right away, I'm 15. And believe it or not, guys, I rarely use 15. I probably caught two people off of being 15. I don't like it. Um, Jesse Hodge, love the channel. Keep up the good work. Thank you for the 10. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with it, but a lot of states, 16 is um, consent. Not only that, in the state of Colorado, 14 doesn't matter, but 15 and up, they have what's called the Romeo and Juliet law. Love the channel. 15 can go up to 10, 10, 15 can go up to nine years without it being a problem. So 15 and 24 is not against the law. 15 and 25 is against the law, but I don't like touching the law just barely. You know what I mean? Just barely. It's like, well, a year ago, this wouldn't even have been a, a crime. I don't like that. I want them to know that what they're doing is a fucking problem. So even like, if I said I was 14 and a 19-year-old came at me, I have a problem with that. 15 years can do 20-year-olds? Yes. Oh, yeah, 15 can do 24. So the Romeo and Juliet is your age plus 10. So plus, plus 9. 10 makes it a crime, okay? So 15 and 24 is legal. 15 and 25 is not legal. That's pretty dis disgusting. So 15 and 24 is not even a felony. It's not even a crime. That's called the Romeo and Juliet law. Tommy, what's Rochelle making for dinner? I honestly, I, I don't know. I don't know. He might be going to the Saints. I'm making a creamy beef mushroom. Creamy beef mushroom soup? No. Creamy beef mushroom, she said. Hope you enjoyed your birthday, swag. Hope you enjoyed your birthday, mother. Oh, see, she can be sweet sometimes. That's crazy. 15 and 24 is morally sick. I agree. I absolutely agree. I absolutely agree, Kim. It is not against the law in the state of Colorado. Believe it or not, I found out that the hard way because it caught somebody. Luckily, luckily, he did some other felonies, so he did go to jail. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, not a, it's not a crime. It's called the Romeo and Juliet. That would be cool, Justin. Seriously, I would love to make a card collection of all the pets we caught. 
I love Tommy's mom, just not her son. <laughs> I love it. I love it. So it's legal for a freshman to go to Yeah, it's 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 wrong. It's gr- it, it's just it's I don't make that fucking rule. I don't like it, but it, that's the rule. They shouldn't be. You're fine. You are so right. A 14 year old should not be actively should not be sexually active. Shouldn't be, but they are. I mean, some of them are. I hope to God not. I hope my kids are like me and wait, wait bloomer because I was 17 when I lost my virginity. My boy's gonna be 17. You know, like. Ugh. When you're an adult, you should date adults. Ah, oh, airball, I saw that, sir. Airball. 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 It was airball. I saw airball. Airball. I'm just kidding. Hey, I do it all the time. I mean, not really, but I did it once. So you guys. Well, see, my birthday was in September. So September's different. You know what I mean? It. Some people are late, some people are early. I don't think it's bad. My opinion is that I was... Years ago, we used to live in Romeo and Juliet. So Romeo and Juliet is a real thing here in Colorado too, Kim. Um, Romeo and Juliet starts at 15 and it gives you nine years. So 15, 24 is okay. 16, 25 is okay. 16, 26 is not okay. 15, 25 is not okay. So the Romeo and Juliet law gives you 10 years. Uh, But 15 uh, 15 and 24, I don't like it. I don't like it. I'll catch them. I'll catch them. In Arizona, the age of consent is 18. I met my husband in high school, and I was 15 when he turned 18. So if you're 15 and your husband, your boyfriend is 17, right? And your your boyfriend turns 18, are you breaking the law? I don't know. Are you? You've already had intercourse. Are you breaking the law? I really don't know. Again, it should a 15-year-old be having sex? No. Again, that's all crazy shit. It used to be even worse back in the 70s and 80s. Eighth grade was part of high school, which meant, yeah, used to be eight. Oh, wait. Oh, really? 12-year-olds were with 19-year-olds. Ooh. What's up, my beautiful people? What up, what up, what up? It's a great day. It's a great day. It's a great day. My little, my little yeah. twenty-one-year-old, you know, foster brother. Um, he got arrested two years ago. He had a girlfriend that was two years younger. So, if you want to know the details, look into the details. It's a fucked-up situation, both sides. It wasn't a problem till they broke up. But you cannot be an adult having, you know, kid pictures. You know, even if you're nineteen and they're sixteen, or you're eighteen and they're sixteen, or whatever it is, you can't have it. You know, put the. It is ridiculous. It's sad. Um, it's cost my parents 60 something thousand dollars in attorney fees and there's real prison time that goes with it. So unfortunately, you know, he had to take a plea, which, which he, uh, is going to be on the registered sex offender list for 10 years. And the only reason why I'm saying it is because they're, 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 they're telling the story so wrong. That's just it. When you're an adult, you should have dated adults. Ah, airball, I saw that, sir. Airball, airball, airball. 
It was airball. I saw airball. Airball. I'm just kidding. Hey, I do it all the time. I mean, not really, but I did it once. We know what we're doing. Uh, honestly, we know what we're doing. Uh, Tommy, is it true that your brother has pedophil pedophilia charges? Just a question, man. Um, my brother is serving time for, uh, for, um, uh, he was, he was 16 and she was 14. He turned 19 and she was 17 and he had naked pictures of her. So he did get in trouble for that. Is he a predator? No. Look her up. She's a real winner. She's a terrible person that she likes to go after people's family, which is, which is crazy. Um, if she only knew the true story behind that um, he got arrested two years ago he had a girlfriend that was two years younger so if you want to know the details look into the details it's a fucked up situation both sides it wasn't a problem till they broke up but you cannot be an adult having you know kid pictures you know even if you're 19 and they're 16 or you're 18 and they're 16 or whatever it is you can't have it you know but the it is ridiculous it's sad um, it's cost my parents 60 something thousand dollars in attorney fees and there's real prison time that goes with it. So unfortunately, you know, he had to take a plea, which, which he, uh, is going to be on the registered sex offender list for 10 years. And the only reason why I'm saying it is because they're, they're, they're telling the story so wrong. Uh, but Blondie Java goes to the, to all the trials. So she's been there and she's going next week. Fucking loser. WebEx, I imagine for Mr. Fellows matter? I believe so. In candor to the court, I think that there are um, just community members who are watching. I don't believe that they're affiliated with either of the parties. I, I do not recognize them as any of the people associated with this case. If the court wants to leave WebEx on, that is fine. If the court wants to take WebEx off, it's also an open courtroom, so I'd be happy with that as well. I'm going to leave WebEx on since it's on now and it appears a number of people, whatever their association, are interested in the case. The sentencing materials that the court has received? Not from the people? Not from the defense. And I do have one additional letter. It's very brief. I provided a copy to the DA if I can approach with that. Sure. There's a gentleman in the back who wanted to be heard and I don't exactly know why. It's his father. Okay. The WebEx thing I'm concerned about. It's a public courtroom. It's a public courtroom, okay. so I'm going to leave the WebEx on. Thank you. I received the additional letter. Yeah. Argument from the people. Thank you, Your Honor. So as the court knows, um, this is a largely stipulated disposition. Count one, he pled guilty to a stalking. That's going to be a four-year deferred judgment. As to the added count six for the unlawful sexual contact, that's going to be four years of probation to run concurrently. He'll register as a sex offender. He'll do non-SOISB probation. He'll undergo a domestic violence evaluation and treatment. He'll have no contact with the victim, M.M., However, what was open for this court was the opportunity to impose a punitive sanction. I think that the recommendations that probation made in this case for one year of work release, as well as all of the additional conditions related to treatment, are spot on in this case. I found that to be an incredibly thoughtful recommendation that took into consideration um, Mr. Fellow's youth and his mental health concerns, but also a lot of the issues that were happening in this case. Um, one thing that I want to point out for this court is the victim, M.M., she's not present today. I don't believe that she or any members of her family have logged in online. But what I will say is that this had an incredible impact on that young woman.
Miss West, Miss Westcott, and I met with her on a number of occasions, and every time we met with her, she would just kind of get to this point where we'd be talking about status or resolution of the case or anything like that, and knowing that she was going to be talking to us would kind of ramp her up, and she would just get to this point where she had to tell us what was going on, and it was incredibly difficult for her. And the disclosure in this case as to the full impact that Mr. Fellows had on her was not something that she was able to articulate over or initially. It was something that happened over time. Every time we talked to her, a little bit more information came out. We got to the point where she went back in for two additional Blue Sky Bridge interviews to talk about everything that had happened during the course of this relationship and the fact that at the time, she was so young. She was 14 when the two of them started dating. He was 18. But of course, it wasn't that four-year age difference. It was about three and a half years. So it didn't cast, classify as a sexual assault on a child. But he did take advantage of that age difference between the two of them. The fact that he's three and a half years older. She was only 14. She was inexperienced and I think, frankly, naive in matters of relationships. He was much older and took advantage of that age difference in order to manipulate her, to convince her that the things that he was doing, that the ways that he was controlling their relationship and the things that he was doing and asking for and demanding of her were all normal. Wow. And that has continued to have a lasting impact on her all the way up until now, where she struggled with body image issues. She struggled with her self-esteem. She struggled with healthy boundaries and healthy relationships because she didn't know any better when she met Mr. Fellows. And Mr. Fellows was in this situation where he's incredibly controlling of her. He's very manipulative. He's pushing her boundaries. He's convincing her that the things that he's seen in movies such as Fifty Shades of Grey are appropriate, are romantic. And even when she's not comfortable with those things, because she wants to please him, because he's older, she goes along with all of those things. And that's had a lasting impact on her for years. And I think it's something that she's going to be continuing to struggle with even after this case is resolved. So the victim's mother, MM's mother, LM, she had talked to us about how manipulative Mr. Fellows was, um, how he can make this great impression at first, but then as soon as something changes or he doesn't get what he wants, it's just an absolute switch. And I think that that's been abundantly clear in the information that is before this court. Um, so he came back as a high risk to reoffend. And that was after the second PSE evaluation, because the first PSE, as the court knows, has to be terminated because he became controlling, defensive, manipulative, and threatening, according to Brooke Summers, who, as this court knows, is one of the evaluators that performs I don't even know, dozens or hundreds of PSC evaluations in this jurisdiction every year. Um, and I've never seen that come up before, that she actually had to terminate an evaluation because of a client's behavior. Even with the second evaluation where he went in with Ms. Gursky, um, she also ends the interview early after he becomes agitated and starts using inappropriate language and displaying inappropriate behavior. And that was when she was trying to calculate his risk and talking about some of those risk factors with him. So I think that it's important for the court to know those things and to consider those things because there's an excuse for everything, as the court saw in the evaluation. Um, I asked to leave this matter on last time we were set for sentencing because I wanted the court to reiterate for Mr. Fellows that he needed to cooperate and participate meaningfully in that PSE evaluation. And the explanation that the court got at that time was that, you know, he's having a hard time. There was a family situation where he had an ill family member and he'd recently fallen on the ice. But then we continue to see that behavior in this second PSC. And we see him coming back as a high risk to reoffend, even after he's given this additional opportunity. Um, so I think that there are so many things that are going on in this case that I want to highlight those things because I know he has family members who are here. I know there were a number of people who provided information in support of him, saying how great of a young man he is. And, and I think those people legitimately believe him, and he does have a great deal of family and community support. However, if you're looking at his rendition of facts in the PSI, where he's this great influence on the victim, everything was magical, everything was fine, he's just trying to convince her not to go to parties, to go to school, that's obviously very contrary to her experience 
that's very contrary to what was actually happening in this case where any time she tries to pull away from him, even if she's just hanging out with her friends or an instance where she's hanging out with her mom, he's calling her repeatedly, he's threatening her, he's saying she's cheating on him, he's accusing her of being in a relationship with some of these other girls when she's with her female friends. And then when she expresses that she doesn't want to be in a relationship with him anymore, he responds by either threatening to harm her, to harm her mother, or to harm himself. And M.M. talked about times where he'd call or FaceTime her crying, where he'd have a gun up to his head. And I think that's important to point out because there was also this reference to times where he says he has a gun, where he says he's killed people or been involved in gang activity. And that came up in the sentencing memorandum as recently as yesterday as things that aren't likely true. And I don't dispute that he was never in a gang. I don't think that he's ever killed anyone. I don't think he's ever killed a baby. But the thing is, that's not coming from M.M. That's coming from him. He was telling M.M. those things so that he could continue to control her. And when he's making threats directly to her or about her family, she's more inclined to believe those. She's more frightened and she feels like she has to stay in this relationship because he's saying those things. There was a lot of blaming of M.M. or a lot of saying that M.M. was not being truthful all the way up until that sentencing memorandum yesterday. That's incredibly concerning to the people. The fact that he says that he can't identify anybody who was harmed, doesn't think that anybody was really a victim one way or another. Wow. The reason that I wanted the court to know this the impact that this has had on M.M. is because that's absolutely not true. Even though she's not here, I think she's not here because the prospect of seeing Mr. Fellows and hearing all of this talked about was just too much for her mental health right now and she needed to take, take a step back. It's not because she's not engaged. It's not because she didn't care about the outcome in this case. It's actually the opposite because it's impacted her so much. So when we look at everything, again, I think that probation's recommendation for that year of work release, I think that that's a good balance. I think that it's a punitive consequence that allows him to continue working, but at the same time, it demonstrates that there is consequences for that level of denial for continuing to come in and say that he doesn't understand anything that was harmed or that anything that he did and how that could have harmed M.M. or saying even when it wasn't just M.M., when he's talking about his other offenses as a juvenile, when he's talking about anything that happened when he was getting in trouble at school, all of that is everybody else's fault. There's no accountability and there's no taking responsibility. So I think that punitive sanction is appropriate to hit home for Mr. Fellows, the consequences and the fact that he does need to take this seriously because he does have the opportunity to not have a felony on his record. And frankly, the way that things are going so far, I'm not convinced that he's making it four years. I think that he's probably going to be back before this court or before Judge Bakke on a revocation and he's going to have that felony on his record permanently. And he's given the opportunity today to move forward and make some changes and not have that happen. But unless there are some drastic changes, I don't see that being the outcome of this case. Thank you. Oh, the only thing otherwise I would note, Your Honor, is that I'm going to ask to set restitution over for 35 days. There was an agreement in the plea agreement in the plea paperwork for $900 in restitution, and that was for counseling fees. There was one additional invoice that I received after that that would up the amount to $1,000, $1,080, I apologize. So I just want to make sure that I have the last invoice um, before we formally submit that. I have just one question. In the PSI, there's a reference to some really concerning conduct during bond. Yes. But when I looked, it didn't appear that that conduct was charged, and it's also obviously
parents of the children that were referenced in that incident. Um, and so I don't actually know whatever happened with that, but it was our understanding that he was going to be charged as a leadership within Weld County for that conduct. Your Honor, he was never charged. I'm not saying he, he was not, but it was our understanding that he was going to be. Yep. I, I think part of the spirit of my question was um, because I know that it wasn't charged, and I, I wondered if... Good afternoon, Your Honor. Good afternoon. I just wanted to speak on Jason's behalf. It's not what he's a good kid. We were very involved with him growing up. Got him therapy weekly his whole life. He's come a long ways. He's not this kid that he's made out to be. Um, when this started, this all started. We started to come to court. There was all these lies about him having guns and babies and all that. We debunked all that. Um, he was accused of putting her up against the wall and kissing her when they were breaking up. There's not even a wall there. I mean, we've debunked everything, but it just keeps going. <clears throat> the, the Firestone thing was because of my son's in this business, he catches online pedophiles and he's caught over 200 of them and like 130 been arrested. So the Firestone thing, my dog ran away and he went to the park to get the dog and there was girls that used to drive around in a golf cart. And he's a very handsome boy. I mean, all his life, the girls have been chasing him around at school and at sports. And we didn't allow him to have girlfriends because we wanted him to do the sports in school. Um, but so he went to get the dog at the park, and they, these girls said something. And we had moved up to Firestone, and he went to college of uh, cosmetology, which was a problem for M.M. or Molly. I don't know if I could say her name. Um, and she was didn't want him being in that school because it was all girls. I think it was him and two other males in there. But anyways, when he went to the park to get the kids, the dog, he saw these girls and they said something to him. And Jason said something back to him. And they said, well, my daddy's a cop. And Jason was probably rude and said, I don't care, whatever. And went on with the dog. Well, my grandkids came up. And they know everybody. So when we moved to this new house, Jason never even went out. He went to school or he went to Molly's house in Denver. So Jason was not known in this community at all. And then the next thing we know, Firestone police knocking on our door and wanting to arrest him for the second time. Because the first one was with the Molly thing, I guess. And then the second time was these kids in the neighborhood. Turns out it was my son has two boys, my grandkids, no disrespect to you. I'm going to okay. interrupt you for a minute okay. because none of us knows whether or not that conduct okay. might later be charged. Okay, I just... His attorneys made a very good argument why I shouldn't consider it, and now you're making statements about it that if it were going to be charged, okay. he might not be in his best okay. interest. Okay, that's fine. So you can move on if you like. Okay. Your Honor, while we've got a break, can I just ask that Mr. Fellows not use the victim's full name? Oh, okay, I'm sorry. Do we call her M.M.? Okay. So when their relationship started, or when we found out about it, I immediately put a stop to it. Jason got very upset with me, and he's like, Dad, I really like this girl. We're connected, and I didn't want to do it. And my wife said, you know, Brian, maybe maybe this might be a good thing. Um, I said, fine, then you contact Mom. The two moms went and had Poppy, and she really liked Jason and said, not sure, but Jason was helping her with that, and she really liked Jason, and she wanted him to continue to date. So I went along with it. But from the get go, I really wasn't. And so, so then when she'd come to my house, we would try. I would try to have conversations with her, and it just, we just, we didn't get along very well. She wanted to be a model, so they would go out. We lived right across from a park. And they'd go over there and, and he'd Jason take pictures of her and she'd be pushing her hair around, you know, like a model would do. And I just thought, you know, it just, one day we were at the uh, pool. She went up to the pool with us. And so I tried to befriend her and I asked her, I said, so what does your dad do for work? He's not my dad. I'm well, sorry, who is he? She said, that's just my mom's boyfriend. I said, okay, well, where's your real dad? We don't know. We think he's dead. I mean, it. Just, she was just different. So over this 
course. So then we come to court and we hear all this bad stuff about Jason, which is totally untrue. Um, um, then they started to break up. Jason come upstairs crying. He's showing me a video, which he was really not into social media. None of our family is. Um, but he showed me this video. Sorry, Eminem. Um, with another girl. They, both the girls barely had any clothes on. And Jason was very upset, and he wanted to tell her mother. And I said, Jason, don't. Well, Dad, she needs to know that her daughter's too. I said, no, it's not your responsibility. Well, I think he did it anyway, and that really made her mother mad. Um, so, you know, so we hired Jonathan. All the court cases, his ankle bracelet, you know, they said he was a flight risk. He was never a flight risk. They didn't want to take that off. Finally, they did. Um, but I just want you to know that Jason's a good kid. This is basically his first girlfriend. They were in love for over two years, they thought. Um, and then it's just, it's just a bad breakup. That's all it was. Um, and this has costed Jason about roughly $48,000, which he's paid us back 18 of it already, which I'm proud of him. So, I mean, he's learned a big lesson here. I just don't think he's a sex offender. You know, does he need to go to some parole or whatever? That's understandable, but not a sex offender. He's already lost a few jobs because of it, a couple apartments because of it. And I just think that would be devastating. And I think that's, I think that's about what I want to say. Thank you. Thank you. A four year deferred judgment with a concurrent four year probationary period with sex offender conditions in the misdemeanor account. Restitution set over for 35 days. Mr. Greenlee, would you respond within 14 days if you have a disagreement to the additional amount? Yes, Your Honor, I will. And then I'm moving to the portion of the PSI on the final page where the specific conditions are set forth. I'm skipping the first one because that's the one that I'm going to address at some length because that's the contested one. Mr. Fellows, you must complete a psychological evaluation and follow all recommendations that are presented in it. You may have no alcohol or illicit drugs, including medical marijuana. You must have a domestic violence evaluation and do any treatment that's recommended. You'll be required to complete what's called the denier's protocol that's described in the mental health offense specific evaluation. Sex offense specific treatment that's described in the offense specific evaluation that includes sexual history polygraph testing. I already talked about the restitution. No contact with MM or her family, not directly, not indirectly. Forfeit all the evidence obtained and seized by law enforcement in the case. And then 11 through 15 are complied with special additional conditions for the supervision of adult sex offenders. Those condition numbers, the court's imposing each of them, 23, 26, 27, 28, and 29. You'll be required by virtue of the plea agreement to register as a sex offender. Some of the members of your family spoke about that being something that they wanted the court not to impose. It isn't within my power not to impose it. It's part of the agreed upon sentence and it's also the law. Cost of prosecution and developing a case plan with your supervising probation officer to comply with all the terms of that case plan agreement. So essentially, I just imposed two through 18 as they're written exactly on the PSI. But the part that's really before the court and the source of the lengthy argument that the court has heard is the punitive sanction. And I think I need to observe a number of things from what I've heard today and what I've read. The first is that your family clearly loves and supports you, and that's a wonderful supportive factor. It helps people do really well on supervision, in addition to helping you in all of the ways that you obviously understand that they help you. 
they know you in certain ways and none of what happened in this case makes those things that they know of you untrue or invalid but some of the ways that folks are talking about you have made it sound like you can't both be those things to those people and also have committed a really serious crime and unless you and hopefully with the love and support of the folks in your life can get your head around the fact that both things can be true you aren't likely to succeed on this probation miss sudano is exactly right because she talks about the fact that this deferred judgment and the supervision that goes with it isn't easy and when and if you continue to talk about the offense and mm and candidly minimize it in the ways that you're talking about you won't be successful i want you to be successful i think your family wants you to be successful i know that you want to be successful and so i'm telling you some of what i'm telling you in the spirit of you have to let go of a lot of the minimization that you are doing throughout the case throughout the psi report and throughout your presentation today or you're unlikely to be successful i think it's probably in your best interest that you don't respond to me right now the facts of the case really concerning. Even if I were to accept that the only things that happened were the ones that you said happened, those would be alone really concerning. You said things in the PSI report that are flat out coercive and manipulative and really concerning. Sending text messages to someone's family it doesn't matter how many people you meant to send it to it's not okay and so i think i need to say first of all that i i don't believe that you only did the things that you said that you did but even if i did only believe that you did the things that you said that you did those things alone are really concerning and if you don't accept that they're really concerning and you and the people that you love and trust the most continue to defend against them by assassinating the person that said them and saying things about her mental health and things like that, you won't be successful on the probation. And I'm going back to, I think you want to be successful on the probation. I want you to be successful on the probation. I know your family does. And so I'm really saying this to you, not to pick a fight with you, not to be disrespectful with you, but you entered into a guilty plea and you entered into an agreement that requires that you do certain things. And you're not starting out like a person who wants to and can do those things. And I'm urging you to change your tune on that. When I consider the punitive sanction, I'm considering mm -hmm. partly the severity of the offense. I think it's really significant. And I think that the concerns that I have about your boundaries and frankly, the idea that as you grow older, if you don't get some of these behaviors under control, I am concerned that you will commit further offenses within our community and that you will prey on folks in a sexual way, perhaps because you don't understand that you're doing it. I'm pretty concerned about the community safety because of your history and because of the way that you are stepping into this probation. I'm pretty concerned about the effect of the offense on MM. I know that she's not here, but the impact on a person who has gone through what she's gone through because of you, if she were here and she heard all the things that are being said about her in defense and all the ways that you're minimizing, that would re-victimize her. And you're saying to me, and you've said to me like three different times, that what you're saying is true. It's and true. I hear that you're saying that. And I 
also hear that you believe it. And what I think you're not hearing is me saying, you, you are not on a road to success if you're not willing to let go of some of the need to blame her. I have not. May I say something, ma'am? I don't think it's in your best interest. That's okay. So I'm going to impose the punitive sanction that the probation department and the PSI recommended, partly because I think it's appropriate to the nature of the offense, and partly because, and I'm, I'm not feeling like this is setting in right now, but I hope that it might later, but partly because the court needs to do something to get your attention that you must take this probation seriously. I'm kind of trying to save you from something down the road. And I'm candidly, when I hear your family talk to you, I'm worried that you're sort of enveloped in a warm blanket of defensiveness that isn't going to help you complete this probation down the road. And what I need you to hear, and it's not within my power to make you hear it, but what I need you to hear is that the court is going to hold you responsible for this offense. And so if you can't succeed on probation, the consequences to you will be very dire. I don't want that to happen, but I'm worried that as long as the people who have authority, which is me in this situation, suggest to you in some way that there's a different way to complete this other than by taking accountability, that you won't complete this. So the spirit of my comments in many ways is to try to help you succeed. The offense itself also merits the punitive sanction. The court imposes a year of work release. You may remain out of custody until the bed opens up. Is that, what, is, what does that mean? Explain it to you. Mr. Greenlee, I'll tell you about it. Anything further, Ms. Sudana? Um, the only thing I was going to note was I think that his pre-sentence confinement credit is wrong because he was in for another week or so um, on that other offense. I don't know if Mr. Greenlee knows the exact amount. That's correct. So 10 total? 10 days pre-sentence credit. Anything further, Mr. Greenlee? No, Your Honor. sure if you said it but could it, if you could just reiterate it if you already said it that it's non-soisp i don't know if i did either it's non-soisp thanks thank you it's past five now so we'll get you the sentencing order Ms. Metz, since you're here can i pick on you to ask how you would like for mr fellows to report he's going to remain out of custody until the work release bed opens so he can start probation i think his probation officer tiernan um will Yes, we, we got covered. But, all right, so no need to separately report? Yeah. Okay. Does anyone else think that we should report? I think Mr. Greenlee will probably answer your remaining questions. It's Do you have another one for me? Yes. We're you. in recess at this time. I'm closing off the WebEx as well. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War in 